Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Enforcers Limited Earnings Conference Call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode. Should you need assistance during this conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note that this conference is being recorded. And now I hand the conference over to Mr. Sandeep Mahindra. Thank you and over to you, sir. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Infosys Earnings Call for Q4 and FI24. Joining us on this call is CEO and MD Mr. Salil Parikh, CFO Mr. Jay Sangrajka, and other members of the leadership team. We'll start the call with some remarks on the performance of the company, subsequent to which we'll open up the call for questions. Kindly note that anything we say that refers to our outlook for the future is a forward-looking statement, which must be read in conjunction with the risk that the company faces. A complete statement and explanation of these risks is available in our filings with the SEC, which can be found on www.sec.gov. I would now like to pass on the call to Salil. Uh, thanks, Sandeep. Good evening and good morning to everyone on the call. For the financial year 24, our revenue growth was at 1.4% in constant currency terms. Our operating margin for the full year was 20.7%. For large deals, we had an excellent year and the fourth quarter. For the full year, we, have, we were at $17.7 billion in large deals, comprising of 90 deals. For Q4, we had $4.5 billion in large deals. This is the highest ever large deal value in a financial year for us. This is a reflection of the trust our clients have in us. We see good traction in cost efficiency and consolidation deals. For Q4, our year-on-year -year revenue growth was flat in constant currency and declined by 2.2% quarter-on-quarter. Our operating margin for Q4 was 20.1%. We had a one-time impact in Q4 that Jayesh will comment on. We're seeing excellent traction with our clients for generative AI work. We're working on projects across software engineering, process optimization, customer support, advisory services, and sales and marketing areas. We're working with all market-leading open access and closed large language models. As an example, in software development, we've generated over 3 million lines of code using one of generative AI large language models. In several situations, we've trained the large language models with client-specific data within our projects. We've embedded generative AI in our services and developed playbooks for each of our offerings. We're committed to ethical and responsible use of artificial intelligence. We became the first IT services company globally to achieve the ISO 42001-2023 certification, testifying to a commitment to excellence in AI management. All of our work in AI is part of our Topaz offering. Our cloud work is growing well. Uh, we continue to work closely with the major public cloud providers and on private cloud programs for clients. Cloud with data is the foundation for AI and generative AI, and Cobalt encompasses all of our cloud capabilities. Data is the other foundation for AI and generative AI. We see data structuring, access, assimilation, critical to make large language models and foundation models to work effectively. And we see good traction in our offering to get enterprises data ready for AI. We are delighted to announce a strategic acquisition of a company in the engineering services space this quarter. Some examples of the work we are doing for a large U.S. company, we've engineered an enterprise-grade generative AI platform that has been rolled out to over 60,000 users. We're working with a large bank and helping them roll out an internal enterprise-wide company-specific generative AI instance of a knowledge assistant. We continue our focus on our margin program. We saw good impact of this during the financial year. Our employee attrition was low at 12.6%, down from 20.9% in the previous year. 
As we look at the start of the financial year 25, we see the discretionary spending and digital transformation work at the same level. We see focus on cost efficiency and consolidation continuing. Our large deal wins in the prior financial year will help us in financial year 25 for our revenue. We also see normal seasonality as we plan this financial year in terms of guidance. With our revenue, with that, our revenue growth guidance for financial financial year 25 is 1% to 3% growth in constant currency. Our operating margin guidance for the financial year 25 is 20% to 22%. With that, let me hand it over to Jayesh. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the call. At the outset, I must say this is an incredible privilege and honor to be the CFO of this iconic organization and would like to thank Salil, Nandan, and the entire board for their confidence in me. As I step into my new role, my areas of focus will be further strengthen collaboration with business to increase our market share, work with Salil and rest of leadership towards tighter ex execution, and continue to steer Maximus program, expand operating margins, and improve cash flow in the medium term. Coming to our Q4 results, Coming to our Q4 results, revenues were flat year-on-year -year in constant currency terms. Sequentially, revenues declined by 2.2% in constant currency and 2.1% in dollar terms. During the quarter, we had a renegotiation and rescoping of contracts with one of our financial services clients, which led to slightly over 1% impact on Q4 revenues. While the part of the work got rescoped, over 85% of the contract is still with us. FY24 constant currency revenue growth was 1.4%. Normalized for the impact of revenues from the FS client, the revenues were for FI24 were within our guidance range of 1.5 to 2%. Operating margins for Q4 were at 20.1%, a decline of 40 bits sequentially, bringing the FI24 margins at 20.7, well within the guidance band of 20 to 22 for the financial year 24. The major components of QOQ margin work for, it, for the quarter are as follows. Headwinds of 180 bits comprising of 100 bits from the one-time impact of contract renegotiation and rescoping, 80 bits from additional impact on salary increases, higher plan building, and visa, visa expenses, partially off, offset by tailwinds of 140 bits comprising of 60 bits from lower post sales customer support, lower provision for uh, client risk receivables, etc., 40 bits from mar project maximus, and 40 bits relating to Q3 impact from cyber incidents. Headwinds at the end of Q4, uh, headcount at the end of Q4 was over 3,17,000, which led to further increase in utilization, excluding training to 83.5%. LTM attrition for Q4 reduced further by 0.3% to 12.6%. Unbilled revenues dropped for the fourth consecutive quarter to 1.7 billion. This is a reduction of $291 million in FY24, which is reflecting in increased cash flows. Free cash flows for, for the year was 2.9 billion, which is a 14% increase over FY23. Free cash flows for Q4 was extremely strong at 848 million, which is the highest in last eight last 11 quarters. This is a result of our focus on improving working capital cycle. DSO for the quarter was 71 days compared to 70 days in Q3. Consolidated cash in cash equivalent stood at 4.7 billion at the end of the quarter. Yield on cash was at 7.1% in Q4 and return on equity improved to 32.1%. ETR for the quarter was 22.2. After accounting for favorable orders, we expect the FY25 normalized ETR to be within 29 to 30% range. We had another strong quarter in terms of large deal wins, $4.5 billion of TCV from 30 deals, including two mega deals. 44% of this was net new. We signed eight large deals in communication, six each in BFSI and retail, four each in manufacturing and life sciences, two in URS. Region-wise, 16 were from North America, 10 from Europe, and four from the rest of the world. We ended FY24 with our highest ever large deal of TCV, 17.7 billion, comprising of 52% net new and eight mega deals. This is a clear validation of relevance of our service offering, deep client relationships, and leadership strength. The board has declared a dividend of rupees 20 for FY24, uh, 24 along with special dividend of rupees 8 per share, which is the total payout for FY2024 will be 85% of FCF in line with the capital allocation policy. The board has approved the capital allocation policy for the next five years, 
effective FY25, the company expects to continue the policy of returning approximately 85% of free cash flows cumulatively over five-year period through a combination of semi-annual dividend and or share buyback special dividend subject to applicable laws and requisite approval. Under this policy, the company expects to progressively increase its regular dividend per share. Project Maximus, a comprehensive margin expansion program, continue to run well across five pillars. This is reflected in more stability in margins for FY24 over 23 compared to the previous years, despite the headwinds from lower growth in FY24. Some of the tracks where we have made progress are value-based selling, automation and AI, and sub-tracks within the efficient pyramid like lower subcons, higher utilization, and higher near show. We continue to focus on optimizing various tracks to increase operating margin in the medium term. Coming to the industry verticals, we continue to see macroeconomic effects of high inflation as well as highest interest rates in BFSI. This is leading to cautious spend by clients who are focusing on investing in services like data, digital, AI, and cloud. Financial services firms are actively looking to move workloads to cloud. Pipeline and deal wins are strong, and we are working on, with our clients on cost optimization and growth initiatives. Manufacturing witnessed a double-digit and broad-based growth in FY24. There is increased traction in areas like engineering, IoT, supply chain, smart manufacturing, and digital transformation. In addition, our differentiated approach to AI is helping us gain mind and market share. Topaz is resonating well with the client. We have a healthy pipeline of large and mega deals. In retail, clients are leveraging Gen AI to frame, to frame use, use cases for delivering business value. Large engagements are continuing S4 HANA and along with infra, app, process, and uh, enterprise modernization. Cost takeout remains primary focus. Clients in communication sector continue to be cautious with growth and challenges. New capex allocation remains under check while the budget remains tight. We see opportunities in cost takeout, AI, and database initiatives. Growth in coming quarters will be led by ramp-ups of previously one deal. EURS clients are taking cautious approach with focus on cost optimization and AI-driven efficiency. We are witnessing a more, more deals around vendor consolidation and infra managed services. Deal pipeline of large and mega deals is strong due to our sustained efforts and proactive pitches of our cost takeouts and digital transformation etc. across the subsectors. Macro concerns in high-tech continue leading to delays in deal closures, decision-making, and plans repurposing spend, discretionary programs are kept on hold. In FY25, therefore, we expect growth to accelerate from FY24 levels in financial services and telecom verticals due to large yield wins. Manufacturing sector, while still showing us healthy growth, will see lower growth than FY24. High tech is expected to remain soft. Driven by our current assessment of business environment, including continued softness with discretionary spend and ramp up for mega deals one earlier, we expect FY25 growth to be 1 to 3 percent in constant currency terms. Our operating margin guidance for the year is 20 to 22 percent. Guidance for FY25 does not factor in today's acquisition of Intech. With that, let me open the call for the question. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Participants who wish to ask a question may press star and 1 on the touchdown phone. If you are using a speaker phone, Please pick up your handset while asking a question. This is required to ensure optimum audio quality on the call. Should your line have any disturbance or do not have a clear connection, you may be asked to return to the question queue. Ladies and gentlemen, you will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Moshe Katri from Wedbush Securities. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks, and uh, Jayesh, uh, welcome and congratulations uh, to, in terms of your uh, new role at uh, Intercept. Sir, so, sorry um, to interrupt you. Your voice is not coming clearly. May I request you to speak a little louder, please? Yes. Um, so, first, my first question has to do with the June and September quarters that tend to be seasonally the strongest uh, in the industry. Can you provide any color? Um, sequential growth from March and June, given your guidance for fiscal 25. Thanks. So, Moshe, this is Jayesh here, and thank you uh, for the wishes. Uh, you know, if you look at within our guidance range of 1 to 3 percent, we expect normal seasonality, which means that H1 would be uh, stronger than the H2. Okay. And then, um, given, uh, you know, you focus you indicated that the uh, 
the fact that uh, Fed are, you know, the Fed's cutting rates is going to be kind of delayed and pushed out, and that's impacting, you know, demand for discretionary spending. Um, is are clients also talking about the, the past few weeks, the political instability in the Middle East? That's also kind of a one of those negative headwinds there. Uh, hi, hi, Moshe Salil. Um, I, I think I understood the question. Uh, we, we spoke a little bit about the outlook in terms of uh, discretionary and digital, and I think your question is: Is the current mi- Middle East situation uh, uh, what clients are talking about? So, um, in general, the sense we've had uh, in discussions with clients is. Um, on the discretionary work and the digital transformation work, it's about the same mindset as it was in the past financial year recently, like in Q4, Q3. Now, I'm sure uh, we, we, we've not specifically heard any commentary on this situation, but I'm sure that's something that, that, uh, that people are thinking about. But it's one among m- many factors that are playing out, is my guess. Understood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question is from the line of Ankur Rudra from J.P. Morgan Chase and Company. Please go ahead. Hi. Thank you, and, and welcome, Jayesh, on the new role. Uh, so the first question is, uh, you know, uh, Salil, the environment clearly appears difficult. Um, now, the, the the main thing that we find a bit, you know, difficult to understand, despite that the uh, lack of revenue acceleration despite very impressive large contract signings that you've enjoyed for close to a year now. Could you maybe elaborate a bit more on the persistent disconnect and if the large deal signings is something that we should pay attention to if this environment continues? Uh, so thanks, uh, Ankur and Salil. Um, what, what we are seeing uh, first on large deals is especially for cost efficiency and consolidation, we are proving to be a, a good choice for clients, and that's where we're seeing a tremendous uh, benefit for what is going on. Uh, the the next, in terms of what we've given as guidance, so first, uh, what we see is uh, the di- digital transformation or discretionary thinking from clients is remaining similar, which is which was uh, slow in the past in Q4, Q3. We see that continuing on. So that, that gives uh, uh, some of the uh, ways where revenue is less within our guidance outlook. The large deals prove uh, a positive part of that outlook. And those are the puts and takes. Now we see in financial services, the coming year appears better. This is not like on on digital or discretionary alone. It's across the industry. Uh, Whereas on manufacturing, we are seeing, which we had a good growth in uh, financial year 24, we're seeing we'll still have growth, but a slower uh, growth in financial year 25. And those are the sorts of puts and takes which give us this this type of a, a guidance uh, with uh, some things which are supportive uh, and, and some things uh, which are constraining. No, thank you for the additional color. I mean, maybe just ask in another way. If you, know, you just report your large contract signings on your contracts above a certain threshold, if we were to look at the overall contract signing, would that would the momentum there be more similar to the revenue momentum we see? So there, uh, we we don't, as, as you know, disclose the other non-large deal signings. Again, the overall color of the pipeline and the deal wins is good, but what it doesn't take into account is when some things on a digital transformation <clears throat> or on discretionary. Uh, slow down. So that that doesn't come into the game when you look at some of the deal wins at w- whatever size. Uh, that, that, those are the puts and takes that we see uh, as we build the uh, forecast for next year. 
And so just one last clarification. The 100 basis point impact you highlighted, Jayesh, is that a uh, revenue impact a combination of the impact of the rescoping, which is probably one time, and a penalty because the, the you know it seems a lot more than 15 percent of one client. Hi, hi, Uncle, and thanks for the wishes at the beginning. Uh, you know that one percent impact or over one percent impact of revenue is reflecting into uh, the margin uh, pretty much directly in terms of 100 basis points. So that that that's the majority or large vast majority of the impact. Okay, so that's not a revenue impact. That's a margin impact. To clarify that. No, it's a revenue impact. That's that's what I said. It's a revenue impact of one person, which is flowing down to margin directly. Okay, okay. Let me repeat. My question was, uh, you know, one person seems a lot more than fifteen percent of one client because I think you've said you you've retained eighty five percent of scope. So this seems to be more than the impact of rescoping. Uh, is that a one time impact uh, which will re which will reverse and then the rescoping only will be part of this? That was the question, essentially. Yeah, so Uncle, when you when you have when you rescope fifteen percent of the impact doesn't mean that the I mean fifteen percent of the work doesn't mean that fifteen percent of the revenue goes away in one quarter, right? It depends on how much of work you have done, how much of the impact you are therefore taking. Right? There is no penalty per se. It's it's a question of how much of work I have done and how much of that uh, that goes away, pretty much. Okay, so understood. The whole of one fifteen percent has gone away in one quarter, right? So it's a fifteen percent of the overall work which got rescoped. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you, investment. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kavaljit Saluja from Kotak. Please go ahead. Hey, hi. Uh, I have a you know couple of questions, or maybe uh, slightly more than that. Uh, the first question is uh, on the guidance in itself. Uh, you know, it has been more of a uh, you know quite a series of misses in FY 2024. Uh, uh, you know, what are the learnings you have incorporated uh, uh, when you basically, uh, you know, have, uh, uh, you know, taken a stance or taken another stab at guiding for FI 2025? Yeah, that's the first question. Uh, hi, Kamal. This is Salil. Um, so what, what we've uh, attempted to do in the guidance is look at what we have seen, for example, on digital work and discretionary work which is uh, reducing or, or slow in the coming financial year where we don't see the change, and then layer in what we see in terms of uh, the large deal wins uh, in, into the financial year 25. And then, as, as in sort of mo most years, we have a view of, uh, seasonality where the H1 is stronger than the H2 for us at Infosys. Uh, typically, we, we see that impact uh, with a, a slower Q3, Q4. So that's how we have uh, uh, attempted to build the uh, guidance that we put in 1 to 3 percent. Okay. Uh, is the process so any... Had, you know, when we started uh, the year last time, you know, we were also coming from a very high growth environment, right? So, you know, we had that, that, that kind of uh, exit trajectory that, uh, that was also uh, helping from a guidance perspective, whether it was getting baked in a guidance perspective. Um, today, when we are looking at it, uh, we are coming, coming out of a 1.4% growth. Uh, and that's why I, I believe, you know, that, that kind of a uh, tailwind is not there in any case in the guidance. Okay, fair enough. Uh, the second question that I had is that uh, can you detail the reasons or factors that led uh, to the rescoping of projects with a large client? Uh, you know, you're typically your large deals do carry execution risks. Uh, so, uh, you know, what are the learnings from the past large deals that you have signed, uh, uh, you know, which you have incorporated uh, in the current crop of large deals here? Yeah. This is Salil. Um, uh, first, I think what we have seen uh, across the board is we have had tremendous success in the large deals uh, and the various delivery uh, of that. Uh, some of the learnings we are putting in place in general, uh, not, not from a specific deal, uh, is more to do with uh, how we understand complexity, how clients look at complexity, and how we make sure that we remain aligned in that. Uh, on the specific deal, there is no other comment. We've made a statement 
uh, in uh, uh, all our press notes. But there's no other comment on that specific uh, situation. Okay. Uh, the final question that I had is you, Jayesh, that uh, you know, last year uh, there was a mention that the endeavor uh, would be to expand uh, operating uh, margins. Uh, you know, I think uh, the guidance band for FY25 is uh, unchanged. So, is there a timeline uh, within uh, which uh, you know within which you intend to expand uh, uh, or increase your uh, operating margins? And what are the factors uh, or the type of environment uh, that is required to uh, push through the margin expansion as such? Yeah, so Kamal, even if you remember, the last time as well we had said, uh, you know, our endeavor is to improve margins or operating margins in, in the midterm, right? And we still maintain that. Uh, we, we haven't changed from that. Uh, the project maximus is, uh, is in work. We have seen encouraging results, as you can see, uh, you know, even from the work of this quarter or, or the previous two quarters. We have called out the benefit that we have got from project maximus. Uh, if you look at FY25 guidance, and the puts and takes of those guidance is, you know, we, we do take back in the, the revenue growth uh, that we are uh, we are envisaging. On top of that, we had a comp uh, flow through of last year. We did our comp increase from November, so there's a full year impact uh, or additional seven month impact coming in in the next financial year plus the the comp that we will do for this financial year. So those are the uh, those are the uh, you know headwinds. And in, in terms of tailwinds, uh, our utilization is still tied below our. Uh, our comfort level of 84, 85 percent. Uh, you know, we our subcons are still higher um, from where, where we think we can we can operate in an optimum level of you know five to six percent. Uh, uh, you know, efficient pyramid. We can improve roll ratios. In an ideal scenario, if the growth is better, the ability to improve roll ratio is much better. But in, even in the in a uh, you know in a constrained environment, we are improving roll ratio. So. Those are those are the uh, factors on efficient pyramid uh, on the Gen AI and automation. We are we we have done a lot of progress and and we are uh, we are doubling down on that. So I think all of those are baked in in the current guidance of uh, 20 to 22. But our endeavor is to continue to you know improve uh, operating margin uh, in the midterm. Okay, thank you for answering my questions and wish you uh, a, you know a good 2025. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Kumar Rakesh from BNP Baraba. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening. Thank you for taking my question. My first question was on BFS. Kumar, sorry. Kumar, sorry. Hi. Yeah. From your line. From your line. Hi. Is this better? Yes, please go ahead. Sure. Um, so my first question was on BFSI. So even if we adjust for this contract renegotiation, um, the vertical seems to have still declined by about 3 to 4%. Well, some of your peers have started talking about recovery in BFSI, and they have also s saw the recovery in, in the March quarter. So is there something outside of this contract renegotiation also which happened in the vertical which is specific to you? So, Kumar, uh, you know, if you look at uh, BFSI, I think, is, you know, one is we, we have a larger BFSI portfolio. Second is uh, our discretionary share on the BFSI uh, is being higher, and that is what is impacting our overall portfolio from the growth perspective. You know, I don't think it's significantly different uh, from the company's uh, overall uh, headwinds. BFSI also has a uh, similar headwind in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of discretionary work that we do with the clients. Uh, in addition to that, you know, most, we we do have exposure to mortgages, etc., which which has, uh, you know, as we have called out earlier, uh, which has remained softer in this, in this environment. But, uh, you know, as you hear uh, from us, uh, we have called out that, you know, we expect BFSI in FI25 to be better than uh, than FI24. So we do see uh, some encouraging, uh, you know, outlook there. Okay. And from the renegotiation part itself, is the impact fully reflected in this quarter or there could be more impact going into the next quarter? The impact uh, is uh, completely taken in this quarter. Okay. Got that. And my second question was around the margin guidance which you have spoken about. So your global peers as well as domestic peers, all of them usually have spoken about margin expansion, confidence around margin expansion this financial year itself. So I appreciate your target of medium term margin expansion. But would you say you are confident of margin to have bottomed out around the levels where you currently are seeing or the kind of mix you have in the order book holds you back from giving any directional sense on that? 
Sarveen Kumar there, you know, we're, we're not guiding uh, which part of the 2022 we will be. Uh, as I said earlier, our endeavor is to, to improve margins from where we are, uh, but we are not giving uh, the financial year 25 guidance. You know, if you go back to the puts and takes, we do have some headwinds in terms of uh, compensation, uh, you know, some of these large deals uh, ramping up during this year, uh, as well as we have, uh, you know, tailwinds coming from pricing, coming from, you know, efficient pyramid, uh, the automation engineer we are deploying. So we will... We will we will not leave any any stone unturned on this project, but uh, we have not yet guided in terms of where we will end up in this year within this plan. Got it, Chair. Thanks a lot, and best wishes in your new role. Thank you, Kumar. Thank you very much. Next question is from the line of Keith Backman from Bank of Montreal. Please go ahead. Hi. Good evening and good afternoon. I also wanted to ask. Um, Two questions that are related, uh, and I'll ask them um, together. The first is, could you just talk about how you see utilization trends um, unfolding this year? It seemed to me that with the labor market fairly weak, that the utilization should go higher. And similarly, um, that wage hikes, with the market being fairly weak on the employment front, across many parts of tech that, you know, it seems to me that wage hikes sh should be lower. And um, maybe I'll just stop there and then I'll ask my follow-on question. If you could just talk about those specific puts and takes that would influence margins. Yeah, so Keith, if you look at uh, our utilization, our utilization including trainees was at 77% last year. Uh, which has gone up to, uh, you know, 80.7 for the full year, and we are exiting at 82. So that that clearly uh, shows a significant five-point increment, uh, you know, from uh, from the utilization perspective. We have been able to deploy all the freshers, a large number of freshers, you know, back to production. Uh, so that's on utilization. Our, uh, our uh, comfort level on utilization, including or excluding trainees, is around 84, 85 percent. So, you know, we still have some headroom there. On the compensation, you know, whenever we decide on compensation, we take multiple factors in account, uh, inflation, uh, you know, peer practices, et cetera. So uh, we, we will take all of that into account uh, during the year when when we decide on compensation. At this point in time, we haven't decided on, you know, the con quantum of the timing as uh, we just did our last compensation in November uh, last year. Okay. Well, this surprises me more. I'll make a statement and I'll ask my follow-up question. That was sort of tepid. Um, revenue growth. I'm, I'm surprised that margins wouldn't go higher uh, during the course of the year relative to this past year, given given those forces and others. Um, my following question, though, relates to Gen AI, and, and there's two parts of Gen AI. There's the demand side and supply side. So I'm not asking about demand. My supply side is: Are, are you factoring in um, increasingly? Gen AI as you're undergoing software development activities on behalf of your clients, is that helping your productivity um, yet, or is it still too early? And along with that, if, if you are using Gen AI to facilitate or enhance your efficiency on code development, is that a negotiation that's starting to unfold with your client um, that they're asking for, you know, lower billing rates, if you will? related to that efficiency. Is that happening yet, or is it still too early? Um, so, so thanks for that. This is Salil. Um, the, the, on generative AI, on the projects we are working on, uh, we are starting to, we have already seen uh, benefits on productivity in software engineering. Uh, what we've seen there is, an, so it's really, more focus on a narrow data set, in this case, the software capability within an enterprise, within a client base, uh, not, not, not sort of broad base today. And there we are seeing uh, impacts and benefits. Uh, what, what we see is typically, uh, we've not seen so far the rate discussion, but we can certainly see uh, in some instances benefits where clients can do more work uh, uh, in terms of uh, creating more output uh, for the same same type of an effort. Uh, so there is definitely a productivity benefit. 
but we've not seen something which has come back uh, on the rates uh, in that sense. Okay, perfect. Many thanks for your help and best of luck during the year. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Gaurav Rateria from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my questions. Uh, my first question is with respect to the uh, ramp up of some of the mega deals that were supposed to start towards the back half of fourth quarter. Have you seen them starting on time and do you expect uh, these to kind of create some momentum in the coming quarters? Hi, Gaurav. So, uh, you know, what we had envisaged at the beginning of the quarter of uh, the mega deal starting uh, in Q4 have uh, have started uh, as, as planned. Got it. Secondly, on guidance visibility, typically when you uh, start the year, you have a certain level of visibility, maybe let's say 65, 70, whatever that number is. Given that you are entering this year with significantly uh, larger deal wins, would it be fair to say that uh, visibility would be slightly higher than the usual year for FI25? So, Gaurav, if you, uh, you know, if you look at over the years with the the portfolio mix changing, where our discretionary portfolio has become larger in terms of uh, our portfolio mix, the visibility has obviously come down, uh, you know, from the annual perspective. Some of these are products are short duration, et cetera, and discretionary in nature. So to that extent, you do have, uh, you know, have that lack of visibility, if I may use that word, uh, versus the years earlier. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, compared to that, if you look at the large deals, large deals does, does benefit uh, from a long-term perspective. So you do have a, uh, you know, have a foundation of large deals, but at the same time, you do have smaller deals which are discretionary and uh, uh, can be, uh, you know, where we are still seeing uh, some of them are being uh, being reduced or uh, being stopped or scaled down. Okay, last question on, uh, you comment on one of the drivers for margin uh, medium term improvement uh, was Gen AI related automation uh, related savings. Uh, how confident you are to, you know, uh, retain these savings as uh, quite possibly these get renegotiated over a period of time and the clients kind of uh, extract that back from the vendor. So just trying to understand is, is this going to be sustainably an important driver for margin improvement in the medium term. Thank you. So, Gaurav, I think where the things will evolve over a period of time, at this point in time, we are able to retain part of the automation AI, Gen AI, part of the work that we are doing. Uh, but, yeah, you know, uh, how it will evolve over a period of time is, is yet, uh, you know, yet to be seen. Gaurav, do you have any follow up? Thank questions? you. That's all Thank from me. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Brian Bergen from TD Coven. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening. Thank you. Um, first one on the workforce. So, understanding you have still some room for utilization and move higher, but do you expect that the June quarter headcount might stabilize or, or may that still be declining sequentially? So, uh, Brian, on the on the utilization, we are currently at uh, 80 82 percent, excluding uh, uh, excluding uh, trainees and 83.5 percent, including trainees. So, we still have a headroom there, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we think we can go up to 84 85 percent utilization. Okay, so implying headcount may continue to decline sequentially. If that's the case, and just run normal course on attrition. Yeah, and and coming back to your other question on headcount, uh, you know, if you look at through the year, uh, we started the year with 77% utilization, uh, you know, and it, the demand environment was different, so we had a different expectation. Uh, through the year, that demand environment has changed, so that has impacted the headcount or the need of the headcount. The attrition has uh, has significantly come down. We are now trending at around 12.6%. Uh, plus, we we got some benefit from from our value based selling in terms of pricing. So all of that has also resulted in a lesser requirement uh, in terms of headcount, and that's why you see a uh, net negative. Going forward, uh, you know, again, we, we, as I said, we still have some headroom on utilization, so we will tap into that. We will look into uh, demand and 
um, you know, over the years we have moved to an agile hiring model where uh, you know we we hire large number, we can hire large number of freshers off the campus. So we will tap into that as required as we go through the year. Okay, okay, I appreciate that detail. Uh, and, and then just on backlog, so you continue to post really strong large deal signings. It's clearly not yet converting to revenue at the same pace, but maybe we can dig in a little bit on backlog trends. Has there been any material backlog degradation or leakage? Uh, is it just significant widening in average duration? Just anything you do to help us understand some of the moving parts that are signing to revenue growth? I don't think there is anything you know, beyond what Salil mentioned earlier in the call in terms of, you know, discretionary coming down, uh, there are no uh, material, uh, you know, large deals uh, being stopped, etc. So it's, it's just a discretionary ram down that, that is resulting into this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Ashwin Mehta from Ambed Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, would like to ask this question a different way. You have uh, close to 9.2 billion of net new deals in FY24. In addition, you will have net new from smaller deals as well, uh, which you do not report. And in addition, there'll be more deal findings in FY25. Uh, plus, we had indicated most of the 2Q deal flow will ramp in FY25. So, uh, assuming whatever duration, ideally the guidance should have been more. Uh, but where are the leakages in the existing business, and is discretionary demand worse in FY25 versus FY24? Uh, so, hi, this is Ali. Let me start. Uh, I think the uh, point on the discretionary outlook uh, or digital transformation outlook, we find it similar to what we've been seeing in this Q4 and Q3. So we don't see a change in that. Uh, and that's what uh, we factored in uh, to how we built, uh, built the guidance, keeping in mind, uh, uh, you know, some of the uh, benefits of, of the large deals. Okay. My second question was in terms of the, uh, the 100 bits impact on margins because of renegotiation, uh, Will that reverse immediately for us in one Q, or will it take time in terms of recovery? So, Ashwin, uh, this is Jayesh here. Uh, this is one-time impact because of rescoping and renegotiation. Uh, you know, there is no reversal happening of this. Okay, okay. And the last one, if I can squeeze, the agile model of hiring is for freshers, which uh, would typically take six to nine months to get productive. So. Uh, is there a need to hire laterals uh, as you go forward or from this year's perspective, given where our guidance is, uh, lateral hiring will be pretty limited? Yeah, so, I mean, see, lateral hiring, you don't really need to plan a year in advance, right? In offshore, you can hire technically uh, lateral two to three months ahead of time. In on you can hire one to one and a half months ahead of time. So that's how we will we keep tweaking the model as we uh, go through the year. Um, so there's no, I mean, we, we have baked in what we, we see in terms of demand today, and if the demand environment changes, uh, the hiring numbers will change accordingly. Okay. Uh, fair enough. Uh, thanks a lot, and all Thanks, Ashwin. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sandeep Shah from Equitus Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my question is in terms of the impact on discretionary projects. Uh, if you look at the pace, the growth slowdown for Infosys and maybe for the industry has started from 4Q of FY23. And uh, most of the reasons cited by you and the others are uh, decline in discretionary spend, uh, which is impacting five quarters in a row for the industry in terms of the discretionary spend. So the question is whether the pace of decline the leakage in the discretionary projects entering FY25 would be similar to what we have seen in whole of FY24, starting with a 4Q FY23 week exit rate. Uh, hi, uh, this is Khalil. Um, I think what we are seeing is the way clients are looking at their discretionary work or, or digital transformation work is quite similar to the recent quarter. 
so we have no comment specifically on you know things which were like uh, from uh, three four quarters back we, we are more seeing how it's changing or not changing in like q4 q3 versus what we are seeing today for the next uh, period in in financial year 25 okay okay and the second question dash uh, just wanted to understand regarding the reversal of 100 digits on the revenue what could be the impact related to 1q to 3q or earlier quarters uh, which has been accounted in the fourth quarter which could have been reversed in the first quarter of fy 25 Sandeep, uh, you know, this is a renegotiation and rescoping that has happened this quarter and the impact is taken in, in this quarter. We haven't broken down into how much of this quarter and how much of the prior quarters. Okay. But is it fair to say fourth quarter will also include some reversal of the earlier quarters? We are not breaking it down further, Sandeep. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. And congratulations, Jayesh. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Vibhor Singhal from Noama Inquiries. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for uh, taking my question. Uh, so then, my question was uh, mainly on if I could basically get an idea on a line item, which is your third-party items bought for service related to clients. Now, I know we've mentioned in the past that it's become a strategic, a strategic part of our business, and uh, but uh, if I look at this number as compared to over the last two years, there's Gone up from around four and a half percent of the revenue to around seven and a half percent today. Uh, it's a, a sizable number at this point of time for the full year that I'm talking about. And typically, these things would come at very little margin. Is this increasing part of this as part of our revenue hampering our ability to expand margins to the uh, to what we could do? So, uh, 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 what I need to say is that this becoming a part of our strategic business strategy is that in some way hampering our uh, ability to expand margins. from the level that they are we we thought it was very difficult to uh, hear you if you could come okay. closer to the mic and repeat your question please i'm so sorry so am, am i better now is it better audible yeah yeah okay i'm so sorry uh, so what i wanted to ask was that if i look at this line item called third party items bought for service delivery to clients which is essentially what we call as pass through revenues now uh, that has increased significantly over the past 3 years from 4.5% to 7.5% now i know in the last, earlier quarters you've called it out that it's now a strategic part of our business uh, be that as it may uh, this changing nature of our the business in which this is becoming an increasingly higher part of our revenue does that impact our ability to expand our margins from the levels that they are at, uh, today uh, because these uh, as far as we know these come at very little margin as compared to the overall company margin and is this the trend that you would we can expect to continue and this line item to continue increasing as a percentage of revenue going forward as well so we know you know if you are undertaking transformation large mega deal you know right. it comes with all the all the costs it's not only effort cost it comes with you know hardware software cost it's because you you are taking over the tanki project from the client and that becomes an integral part of the project delivery and as a result you have to procure some of that and uh, you know and cook and provide the end to end services to the client and that's where you see this cost uh, the good good part about this is that this these kind of businesses become very very sticky businesses with the client and long term uh, commitments from the client and so it's a long term business so far as we are making overall margins on the deal that's how we look at it we don't look at it you know whether it is third party cost or subcon cost or effort cost or maybe look at it whether we are making an overall margin on the deal while deciding whether we want to go for a deal or not uh, more importantly you know most of these deals that we have we have taken we have got much more work from them or significantly more work from them in the surround uh, environment from the client uh, which is how we look at it as a portfolio of the business got it we But don't have a view in terms of whether and whether it remain at the same level or elevated level it will depend on the the kind and nature of these come and how we sign it in the future got it i think you preempted my next question uh thanks for that but just one more question on the subcontractors uh subcontractors has actually come down over the past couple of years uh, from an overall percentage point of view but it's still i would say higher than what we have historically done pre covid numbers so where do you believe where are we comfortable with this number and given that generally at this point of time Uh, given the revenue growth is quite low the demand environment in terms of our 
uh, work that we require is not that high given our guidance of 1 to 3 percent. Do you believe there is scope for further reduction in the subcontracting cost from the current levels or do you believe at uh, 8 percent that we are today, we've kind of hit the number that uh, hit the bottom and it's probably going to stabilize at this level? Yeah, so, uh, Vibor, this is one of the tracks under, uh, under Project Maximus, uh, you know, under the efficient pyramid uh, of reducing subcontractors. We have reduced subcontractors from the peak of last year by almost 3%. Uh, you know, historically, in the past, we have operated in 5 to 6%. So we believe there is some headroom uh, to bring that down. Got it, got it. Uh, great. Thanks, Jay. Thank you so much for taking my questions. Uh, that's all from my side. And wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Vidur. Thank you. A request to all the participants. Please use your handsets while asking a question. The next question is from the line of Surendra Goel from City Group. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening, everyone. So uh, I joined the call a bit late, so apologies if this has been answered before. Uh, but this uh, case of project or a contract restructuring, uh, recoping, is this like an isolated instance, or are you seeing multiple examples with this being, this being the only significant one to really call out? So, so this is one, we, as we have called it out, it's one-time impact of a large contract in financial services uh, client. It's, it's impacted our revenues by over 1%, and therefore, you know, margins are impacted by 1%. Uh, it's a renegotiation and rescoping of an existing contract. At the same time, if you look at it, over the last few years, we have got additional work from the client, and the 85% of the work under this deal is still continuing with us. So um, that's all I can offer at this point in time to comment on this specifically. You know, Josh, my question was, is this an isolated instance, or are you seeing more uh, such deals getting rescoped than impacted? So if, I mean, since the... The reason I say it is one-off or one-time impact is, is it's an isolated impact. We have not really seen any other large contracts being descoped or renegotiated. renegotiated. Right. And does JMAI have any role to play in such uh, rescoping of contracts? Uh, there is no... Uh, I mean, this. the reason behind this rescoping or renegotiation is nothing to do with JMAI. Um, uh, one last question. Uh, like, How do you really date such things into your guidance process? Right. Uh, is like, would you be kind of baking in some kind of uh, costume into the guidance? Because obviously, rescoping seems to be a common theme. It was mentioned by another large tier of yours recently. So, is there additional kind of impact built in, or this is a risk as it comes along? So, when when we give guidance, uh, so when we we look at what is visible at this point in time. You know, we bake in everything, you know, in terms of we know that the discretion is going, so we have baked that in. We know the large deals that we have signed, so we have baked that in. Um, we, we we don't expect, you know, this is one of incidents, so we don't expect uh, any large uh, incidences like that, so that's not really baked in. Uh, fair enough. Thanks a lot, Jay. Thank you. Thank you, Sarin. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nitin Padmanabhan from Investec. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, so, Salil, uh, uh, you mentioned that, uh, you know, the discretionary spending environment is similar to that of Q3 and Q4, and there's no change. Uh, is it, uh, considering that Q3 and Q4 have seen higher declines versus the, uh, versus the other quarters of uh, 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 FI24, uh, uh, is it uh, fair to assume that Q3, Q4 from a discretionary spending perspective has been the uh, worst uh, versus the whole of FI24? And we are basically assuming that that, con uh, that kind of a situation is sort of continuing through FI25. Um, that's the first question. Uh, so on... Um what we saw in Q3 and Q4 uh, is, is obviously in our normal uh, normal year, there's differences between Q1, Q2, which, which are typically stronger, and Q3, Q4. So th those are things to be layered into any view that we have. Uh, looking backwards, we don't have any specific comment uh, on, you know, which, which quarter, where, where things were. Uh, we talked, as you, as you know, probably on 
starting with Q1 or even Q4 of the prior year, uh, th this sort of a view, but we had not we had not given um, let's say quantification of which which quarter was where uh, in that sense. Uh, having said all of that, uh, the, the general perception, uh, the general observation we have is uh, things you know change uh, little by little by by industry uh, as well. Uh, and uh, things evolve across geography as well. So there's not like w one picture that is there. Uh, we are more looking at it from that immediacy of the recent uh, sort of discussions we've had with clients to what we are having now uh, for the future work. Yeah, and and is this uh, discretionary uh, headwind uh, uh, specific to more specific uh, or let's say uh, more pronounced in BFSI? Uh, is there any such trend or uh, is it broad-based? Uh, no, no, nothing which is like that, very specific onto, onto FS. Huh? Sure. And uh, lastly, uh, see, our utilization is at 83.5%, uh, including trainees, and uh, we think it can go up to 85 um, now, usually, at least uh, over the last many years, uh, uh, pullback in distribution has always been uh, pretty sudden. So, uh, are we risking uh, opportunity uh, by maximizing on utilization? Uh, is that something to worry about? Is uh, uh, just a question out there? So, you know, as I was saying earlier in the call, you know, we have moved to an agile hiring model. Right. We can, we, if you look at an FY23-22 numbers of, you know, fresher hiring, more than half of the freshers were hired through off-campus cycles, right? So we have that ability to, uh, to dip into. We are at 82% including uh, trainings and 83.5% excluding trainings for the quarter. So that's why we are exiting. So we still have, you know, if you look at including training numbers, uh, we, have, we still have to do 3% of headroom. Um, our attrition is still, you know, at a uh, much uh, subdued uh, levels of 12.6 percent. So uh, we don't see that as a as an additional threat as well. So you know, we will we will calibrate this as we go through the through the quarter and year uh, and take corrective actions. We don't really think that. Uh, and of course, you know, if, if there is a need, we can always uh, dip into subcontractors, uh, you know, to capture the demand and uh, replenish that uh, through hiring. So all of those. Uh, those tools are available to us to catch the market because it hasn't changed. And uh, lastly, from a margin perspective, uh, 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 at least in the near term, uh, those 100 pips will be a tailwind and non recurrence of visa costs will be a tailwind. Uh, so there, there should be a pickup in margin, uh, 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 at least in the near term. That, that's a fair assumption to make. Or do you foresee any other headwinds? Yeah, so yeah, so if you look at, uh, you know, I did give a margin walk at the beginning of uh, the call as well. Uh, you know, we had some tailwinds in this quarter as well, you know, from from the lower, uh, you know, provision for uh, doubts and better provision towards client collectibles as, as well as, uh, you know, posting customer support. So those are the headwinds, I mean, tailwinds this quarter, uh, which will become headwind in the near term. So I think you have to factor all of those when, when you're looking at headwinds and tailwinds. So... Sure, perfect. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jayesh, and all the best for and uh, congratulations for the elevation. All the best for you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of question for Tony from Victor Asset Management. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for the opportunity. My question was in this contract uh, renegotiation, rescoping thing. Uh, for one contract to make such a large difference of 100 basis points, on, 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 on revenues could mean that the contract needs to like six seven percent of our revenue base, which seems just impossible to make. So what, what what am I missing here? So Prashant, it's a it's a renegotiation of renegotiation and uh, you know, rescoping of a large contract. Uh, I don't think we are giving uh, any further colour on this. So it's a large uh, financial services contract. But this hundred basis points is it like an accumulation of impact of several quarters in this one quarter, or this is just just pertaining to this quarter alone? You know, when you renegotiate a contract, you will have you know one-time impact on that coming from that, right? If it is a fixed-price contract, so uh, when you renegotiate, that is likely to happen uh, irrespective of whether it is accumulated or not. 
Okay, understood. <clears throat> and the uh, second question was on uh, your margin kind of trajectory. So uh, when you joined in, the margins used to be like a band of 23 to 25. I think it was low to 22 to 24 uh, soon after you joined. And now we are operating in a band of 20 to 22. Just want to understand, like, uh, what has been, I mean, is it uh, is it a function of the large deals that have uh, gone up a lot in our business mix or something else? Just kind of uh, looking from that point to, uh, uh, to today, what has changed in the business complexion, which is leading to this uh, lower margin, obviously, over a number of years, not, not just overnight? I think, Vakshan, there are a number of factors on that, right? There are, uh, I mean, there is... When, when we had an elevated level of attrition as well as elevated level of demand, we had to hire employees, uh, you know, at, at a premium from the market. The demand supply uh, equation had changed in the last two quarters, so that was that was one factor. Even uh, during uh, during the high growth environment, um, the other factors are, you know, the business mix as well, you know, the the pricing pressure that we had uh, on the core part of the business. So I think there are multiple factors that has played over a over a longer tenure uh, tenure period that you are talking about. I've been here for almost 11 years, so you know, I'm, I'm assuming that you're talking about since I joined. Uh, but uh, coming back to your questions in terms of you know where we see uh, our endeavor is to grow margin from where we are today. Uh, we have said that in, in midterms we want to expand the margin from where we are. So we, there's everything that we are doing to improve margins. All right. Okay. Thank you much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We will take that as our last question. I will now hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. Uh, thank you. Uh, so thanks, everyone, for joining in. A few comments from my side. Uh, this is Salil. First, we are really excited. Our large deals were at $17.7 billion in the year, largest uh, that it's been uh, in any financial year. Uh, very, very focused on cost efficiency consolidation with 90 deals overall. Second, we are doing incredible work in generative AI. Uh, we are really uh, excited with the opportunities here. We are working across uh, different areas of impact. Uh, one of the examples of 3 million lines of code uh, that we've uh, developed through generative AI, uh, large language model, is just uh, amazing, amazing types of results we're seeing uh, at this early stage uh, of the generative AI uh, opportunity. Uh, next, our margin program is working well. We are excited about it, uh, and we want to uh, keep our focus on it with a view to expand our margins uh, uh, over, over time. Uh, we, we are really excited about the acquisition we've done in engineering services. It's, it's a phenomenal growth area. Uh, it's in a market we, we understand well. We're doing quite well in the European market, uh, and it's a space even within engineering services, more, more narrowly on automotive, uh, which, looks, um, uh, which looks really good. Uh, one of the things we, we didn't talk maybe a lot about in, in the call, but I just want to highlight was we had extremely strong cash generation uh, at uh, $2.9 billion, uh, for the full year. With all of that, we're really looking forward to delivering our growth and margin guidance uh, for this coming year uh, and, and looking forward to more and more work that we see through all of these different uh, activities. Uh, thank, thank you all for joining us and catch you at the next quarter call. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Infosys, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines. Thank you.